All right, so this is Next Generation Programming, Rust and Elm. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, so let me start by uh, talking about what I mean by sort of the next generation. Um, so why aren't these the current generation and why do I think they're going to be representative of the next generation of, of programming languages? Um, so these are modern languages. They're in wide use today, but not nearly as much as sort of the more popular languages like you might be familiar with JavaScript, Python, Java, things like that. Um, they're modern, but they're not really mainstream. Uh, they're sort of uh, more used in sort of niche settings by smaller organizations or, or smaller teams. Um, but they are sort of pushing the boundaries of what programming languages can do and how much they can help us. Um, and they're significantly different from what you find in sort of mainstream languages today. So it's not just that they're trying new things, but they're trying sort of radically different things. So I think putting all these things together, uh, maybe these aren't the most popular languages today, but I think they're representative of what the next generation of languages are gonna look like. And over the course of this talk, we're gonna go over sort of what makes them different and why you might be interested in them. So let's start with Rust. Uh, so this is from the Rust webpage. It's a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. Here's the Elm homepage, uh, a delightful language for reliable web apps. So Elm is an alternative to JavaScript. You use it to make browser-based UIs. Rust is an alternative to C++. So you can use it for just about anything, uh, anything you could use C++ for. Um, that includes, by the way, making applications in the browser because now with WebAssembly, that's something you can do too. We'll talk a little bit about Rust and WebAssembly later. Um, so comparing these two home pages, one word you might notice they have in common is reliable. This is a goal of both of the languages is to help people make reliable software. And we'll talk more about the specifics of how each of them does that in a bit. Um, they do have two uh, other descriptors though. Rust self-describes as being efficient. That's one of the goals of Rust. Um, being an alternative to C++, uh, runtime performance is very, very important to Rust. And we'll see some benchmarks later that sort of demonstrate that. Elm, on the other hand, doesn't say efficient. Elm self-describes as being delightful. So Elm is a lot more interested in sort of developer experience and ergonomics and have, helping people have a really good time when they're building their software, even if that means sacrificing some efficiency. So you can see some similarities and some differences in uh, what the two languages do, but by far the biggest difference between them is their scope. Elm is focused on building browser-based UIs, that's what it means by web apps, whereas Rust is much broader. It's targeting a much wider swath of possible um, applications. And each of those sort of has their own trade-offs. Um, the narrower focus, the easier it is to do one thing well, and the broader the focus, the more things you can use it for, but sort of the larger and more complex the uh, language. So let's focus in a little bit more on Rust first. Um, so Rust compiles to binaries, like machine code um, that's not running on a virtual machine. It doesn't have a garbage collector. Just like C++, you compile your Rust program and you get a static or, or dynamically linked binary out of it. Um, Rust does have C interop, so if you want, you can have your Rust code talk to C libraries, or if you've got an existing C or C++ project, you could incrementally bring in some Rust code to that. Um, it's got all the modern conveniences you'd expect from a programming language. It's got a package ecosystem, there are editor plugins, learning materials, all the types of things that you would expect from any modern language. Um, Rust is often compared to Go uh, in addition to C++, and to be honest, I don't personally think that's a great comparison. Uh, Go as a programming language is a very simple language. It's very quick to learn. That's one of its design goals. Um, and it's intentionally simple. And it has a very fast compiler. All of these things were design goals from day one of Go, and they're re really reflected in the language that Go is. Rust, on the other hand, is a very complex language. There's a lot to learn. And compared to a lot of other modern programming languages, in particular Go and, and Elm, um, the, the compiler is not very fast. Maybe if you compare it to like C++ or Scala compiler, maybe it's more reasonable, but um, fundamentally, if you like Go, I don't know that there's necessarily good evidence that you're gonna like Rust because it's, it's pretty much doing a lot of different things. Um, having said that, as we'll see later, uh, also the gap between how fast Go is and how fast Rust can be uh, is also pretty substantial. So if you need a lot of high performance stuff um, and Go is not an option, Rust might be an option for you. Um, okay, turning to Elm, so Elm, a, a delightful language for reliable web apps. Um, Elm really focuses on having a really fast, really friendly compiler with really great error messages. Um, more similar to Go, Elm is also a language that prides itself on being small and simple. Um, Elm does have JavaScript interop, so JavaScript, uh, you know, being sort of the, the lingua franca of uh, web UIs. So Elm applications can talk to JavaScript applications if there's some JavaScript library that you really need. Or vice versa, uh, if you've got a big JavaScript or TypeScript code base, uh, 
uh, introducing Elm incrementally through its JavaScript interop is actually the most popular, most common way that people introduce Elm to their existing stacks. Um, and again, similar to Rust, it's got packages, its own package ecosystem, editor plugins, learning materials, all the things you'd expect from a modern programming language. So Elm is often compared to JavaScript frameworks like React and, and uh, Angular and Vue and so forth, um, which is in some sense is understandable, but uh, like the Go and Rust comparison, it's not completely apt. Um, the biggest difference is that frameworks, you're actually writing JavaScript or TypeScript day to day. I mean, if you're using React, Vue, Angular, any of those things, that's the programming language you're using. Whereas with Elm, you're actually using a different programming language altogether. You're not writing JavaScript, you're writing Elm, and, and they're very different programming languages. The reason that this comparison so often gets made is that Elm actually ships with enough batteries included that you don't need a framework to do web development with it. In fact, there really aren't any notable Elm frameworks. Some um, people don't really use them. So that's why people often say, well, are you using Elm or are you using React or are you using Elm or, or are you using Angular? It's because, well, if you're using Elm, you don't need a React or an Angular or some equivalent like that. In practice, they're not really used. Um, so one of the things that, that Rust and Elm have in common is that they're very battle tested. Um, before we move on to that though, let me, let me pause and ask if anyone had any questions about any of the Rust and Elm things uh, we've talked about so far, any of the high level big picture stuff. So one of the things they have in common is that they're both at this point quite battle tested languages. So Rust has been around for about a decade. Um, back in 2010 when its first uh, release happened, it was one single developer working on it. And now about a decade later, uh, it's evolved to have a significant uh, a list of contributors and a large team of people working on it. Um, and they like to develop the language using what they call radical openness. Um, this is a keynote from RustConf 2018 where they talk about their conception of radical openness and what that means. It's sort of a design process where they try to include as many voices as possible and get everyone um, into the table and just, just be completely open and transparent about absolutely everything they do. Um, this does have its downsides, which uh, one of the core contributors talked about in a blog post called Organizational Debt. Um, and the author wrote about something, uh, basically a, a small language feature that they were working on where it had like 800 comments that they had to parse through. And they found it essentially overwhelming to participate in a design process like that when the, the volume of uh, participants is so high, it becomes uh, difficult to keep up. And there was a line in that blog post, something like, Rust is my full-time job and I find it impossible to keep up. Um, so there are pros and cons to this, this approach of radical openness, but it's, it's, there are pros and cons that the Rust team sort of embraces. Um, Rust is a pretty well-funded operation. Um, they have multiple full-time paid developers. Uh, Mozilla is the, the company that's sort of the, the biggest backer of Rust. Um, they even have uh, full-time paid community engineers and people whose job it is just to engage with the community um, and help uh, make uh, various non-programming things happen. Um, and uh, this sort of uh, is maybe necessary, maybe not, but uh, the reality is that Rust is a very large, very complex language, um, and they do have very frequent compiler releases. So all the people that are working on it are constantly adding things. Um, Rust has very strong backwards compatibility guarantees, so they're really never removing things. Um, and there are, I think it's every six weeks the, the, there's a new compiler release as a result of this. Um, so contrast this with Elm. Elm's been around for a similar period of time. Um, 2012 was its first release, so it's been around for about eight years. Um, initially, it was one single developer, Evan Chaplicki, and, uh, and now it's grown into sort of a, a core team, but Evan is still sort of in, in charge of Elm. Uh, he's the, the benevolent dictator for life, as they say in the Python community, the BDFL. Um, Evan wrote about sort of like his approach and, and why uh, he, uh, you know, how he sees Elm uh, and, and like why he does things the way he does in this keynote called What is Success? Um, and he also wrote about some of the downsides and some of the hard things about um, you know, this approach in the hard parts of open source. So uh, you can sort of contrast this with, uh, with how things are run in Rust. Um, so Elm is a much smaller operation and a much smaller language. Uh, it's one full-time paid developer, namely Evan. Uh, he works at No Red Inc., which is where I work. And everybody else who contributes is an unpaid volunteer. Um, so in contrast to Rust, which is a large complex language with frequent compiler releases, Elm is a small, simple language, again, intentionally, not because of necessarily resource constraints, it's just that Elm wants to be a small, simple language um, that's you know, narrowly focused on one domain. Um, and it has relatively infrequent compiler releases. So there's not a lot of churn, uh, you know, the, the like breaking changes to the compiler really only happen on a scale of years rather than a scale of months or weeks. Um, 
Both of them have had a, a lot of conferences. Uh, so Rust has had five different conferences since like 2016, 20, uh, 2019, et cetera. Um, Elm has had, uh, would have had five this year, except that Elm Japan, which was announced for the first time this year, uh, ended up getting canceled like so many conferences due to COVID-19. Um, but both of them have, have pretty large, uh, like healthy communities, even if those communities still pale in comparison to like, in Rust's case, the C++ community, which is much, much larger. Um, and in the Elm case, uh, you know, the JavaScript community is probably the largest community of programmers in the world. Um, so they're both uh, sort of like uh, large enough to be self-sustaining and have healthy communities and healthy ecosystems, um, but not so large that they're considered sort of like mainstream languages yet. Uh, we talked about earlier, one of the things that Rust and Elm have in common as, as a sort of shared goal is reliability. That's a, a, that word is in both of their sort of uh, one sentence self-descriptions. So let's get a little bit more specific about what that means. Uh, so here are some things that are true of both Rust and Elm. Uh, they're both statically type-checked languages. Um, they both have sound type systems. So some languages, like notably TypeScript, uh, which is often considered a, a, you know, a competitor to Elm, um, the type system is uh, unsa unsound, which means that even if the type checker says, hey, all of your types look good, you might actually still get runtime type mismatches because the, the, sometimes the compiler is incorrect. It, it thinks it's got the types right, but actually it's, it's not right. Um, both of these languages have sound type systems where if the compiler says these are the types, those actually are the types at runtime. Worth noting that there are sort of exceptions to that in the case of interop. So if Rust is doing some like unsafe stuff with C, it's possible that C could mutate some memory and make the types be wrong at runtime. Um, Elm does have JavaScript interop and uh, it has stricter guarantees than, than Rust, but certainly if you're using JavaScript interop, um, any of that JavaScript code you write plays by JavaScript's rules rather than Elm's rules. So all of your Elm code you can rely on if the compiler says it's this type, that's actually gonna be the type at runtime. You'll never get a runtime type mismatch from your Elm code, but if you're doing JavaScript interop, you might get some there. Um, neither language has an any type, which is uh, something you also find in, in languages like TypeScript. Um, this is sort of like an escape hatch that says, hey, compiler, you know, I know that it looks like it, this is one particular type, but actually trust me, I think it's gonna be another type. Um, or in C and C++, you can have unsafe casts. Um, both of these languages don't have a first class concept of this, which again means that you can sort of trust the types a lot more. Um, neither of them has what, what's known as the billion dollar mistake. So this is, uh, that, that term is coined by Sir Tony Hoare, who introduced the, uh, the concept of the null reference, um, which has led to things like null pointer exception, undefined is not a function, uh, all of those fun things, uh, nil error. Um, and he said that he considered this his billion dollar mistake because he believes that since he introduced it decades ago and, and like the year 2000, he thinks that it's caused more than a billion dollars in economic damage and he regrets having <laughs> introduced that to the world. Um, so neither Rust nor Elm have that you know, null or nil or undefined or anything like that. Um, they handle those, those types of scenarios where a value might or might not be present uh, using tagged unions, other, other techniques like that. Um, and finally, both of them are immutable by default. And this is where they both diverge a little bit. Um, by, by default, Rust is, uh, all Rust values are immutable, but Rust has sort of opt-in mutation. You can tag something as saying, this is a mutable value and I can mutate it, uh, but it has additional restrictions on how that works. Um, whereas Elm goes in the other direction and says, not only is everything immutable by default, everything's immutable always. And in fact, Elm takes it a step further and says, all Elm functions are pure, like they can't have any side effects. Um, so Elm is a pure functional language. Rust is an imperative language, but both of them agree on sort of immutability being the correct default. And, uh, and only if uh, you sort of um, are, are, are opting into mutation in Rust can you actually get that. Um, some of Rust's uh, sort of like banner reliability features are uh, memory safety and, and lack of data races. Uh, so data races refers to in concurrency when you have like, let's say two threads that are trying to access uh, uh, the same value, there's a pretty big difference between whether they can both read from that value or whether one or both of them can write to that value at the same time. If there are potentially multiple threads able to write to the same value at the same time, um, that is to mutate them at the same time, you can get what's known as data races, which can cause all sorts of problems. So Rust's opt-in mutation comes with a lot of compiler guarantees to make sure that you can only have one thing mutating a particular value that's being shared by multiple threads at the same time. So they're able to rule out data races as an entire category of errors. The other one uh, that's part of Rust's sort of tagline of reliability is memory safety. And when they talk about memory safety, what they mean are the types of bugs that you get in C and C++ from being able to write to parts of memory that you should not be able to write to. 
And those can cause not only bugs, but also critical security vulnerabilities. So this is a graph of uh, a report that came out from Microsoft about uh, sort of CVEs that is like really critical security vulnerabilities um, that had been uh, published by year. And they broke these down in terms of which ones were caused by memory safety problems versus non-memory safety problems. So the dark part of the graph, those are the ones that were caused by memory safety. And this is going all the way back to 2006, so more than a decade of data. And as you can see, about 70% of the, the memory, uh, the, um, the, the critical vulnerabilities were caused by memory safety problems. So the fact that Safe Rust is able to rule these out with the compiler and make it so that you don't have to worry about these anymore um, is a really big deal. Now again, that's, that's only true if you're writing just safe Rust. Uh, you can still potentially have those problems if you're doing C, FFI, or things like that. Um, but you can imagine that if uh, all of the code that were currently written in C++ were somehow magically written in Rust instead, this number would be so much lower that, that a lot of these critical vulnerabilities would just go away. Um, so this is a really important part of sort of Rust's identity as a language that's fast enough to compete with C and C++, but uh, much, much, much safer and, and much less error prone. So this is what they mean by reliability. Elm goes a little bit further and has a tagline of no runtime exceptions at all, like no crashing. So not only do you have memory safety and not only do you uh, not have data races, but you also don't even have uh, runtime exceptions. So Elm literally does not have try catch because all of the ways that it has with dealing with runtime issues like that um, are, are dealt with in, in other ways that don't crash. Uh, now, it's, it's not, that's not to say that it's impossible to crash an Elm program. Um, obviously, like you can get a stack overflow uh, if, if you run out of stack space. Um, there are various ways that you, you can crash an Elm program. But in practice, it's so rare to see an Elm program actually crash that people who use it have generally sort of stopped thinking about it and, and don't really remember that runtime exceptions are a thing until they maybe do some JavaScript interop or something like that. To be more concrete about this, um, this is a graph of the company where I work, No Red Inc. Um, and this is going back to 2015, uh, which is when we started using Elm. Um, and uh, these are our production runtime exceptions. We have like a, a logging service that detects whenever there's a runtime exception thrown in the browser. And you can see there have like, been like tens and thousands from our legacy JavaScript code. Um, our Elm code, it's not zero. It's not literally zero runtime exceptions, but it's zero pixels on the graph because the number of times that it's happened in the last five years is so low that it's, it's not even visible on a graph like this. So it's not literally zero, but it, the point is that it's negligible. Like we don't think about our, our Elm code crashing at runtime or, you know, in the browser um, ever really. I mean, it's just not something that we worry about anymore. Um, and it hasn't been for years now that our, our whole front end essentially has become uh, Elm plus a tiny bit of legacy JavaScript. So this is a much stronger guarantee, but again, worth noting that Elm is in part able to do this because it has that narrower focus than Rust. It's, it's just about browser-based UIs as a garbage collector. Um, it's a lot easier to try and, and aim for something uh, this high uh, when you're, you have that narrower focus. So this is the, uh, the computer language benchmarks game. Uh, this is a, a, a benchmark that compares a whole bunch of different programming languages um, in terms of uh, like how they perform on various, like a whole suite of benchmarks. Um, worth noting that they, they, they do do a good job saying this is a game, you know, these are uh, like performance uh, measurements that are not scientific. They're based on like how did the people who implemented the particular language specific implementations of these um, do them. Like maybe if they use different libraries, they'll get better performance. Maybe if they spent more time on them, they'll get better performance. But overall, it's, it's one of the best comparisons we have to give us at least kind of a ballpark idea of, of how these languages compare. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, the top of the heap are C and C++. Um, middle of the pack is, is Java. Uh, Swift is actually right here, right next to Go. So uh, very, very similar there in terms of how they do on these particular benchmarks. Um, then you have JavaScript, Python, and Ruby, rounding out some of the, the most popular languages. Um, Rust is right there next to C and C++. It's not quite as fast, at least on these benchmarks, as C and C++ which probably makes sense because some of the ways that Rust achieves some of its guarantees are by inserting things like mandatory um, array bounds checks and things like that, which, which do have some runtime overhead. Um, but overall, you can see it's, it's incredibly, incredibly fast. This is not a language that's sort of competing with JavaScript on performance. It really is competing with C and C++ and, and really doing quite well. Um, so this is part of the reason that, you know, I think it's maybe not the right comparison to say, oh, should I use Rust or should I use Go? Uh, there's a very large gap between the two in terms of performance, 
but also a very large gap between the two in terms of compile time, in terms of simplicity, um, in terms of like how long uh, it takes you to ship a particular feature. One of the things we talked about is, is Rust has these additional checks for concurrency to prevent data races at compile time. And the result is what's called the borrow checker. And um, one of the things that's true about the borrow checker in Rust is that it's a new category of errors that you can get at compile time that you just cannot get in any of these languages. So you have your type checker and then you have a totally separate checking step on top of that, which is just something that you have to sort of step through and deal with um, that sort of reduces your iteration time to build a particular feature. But again, if you need this level of performance, um, that can very easily be worth it. Um, looking at Elm in the browser, uh, this is a lighthouse performance comparing uh, a lot of different JavaScript frameworks. So again, Elm is often compared to frameworks and this is uh, no exception. So here in the middle, you can see um, the most popular ones, React, Angular, and Vue, and they're sort of uh, middle of the pack in terms of their lighthouse scores for this application. This is uh, similar to the computer language benchmarks game. This is what's called the real world app. It's basically an application where all of these languages, or all these um, frameworks in, in Elm were also uh, used to, to build the same application to the same specification, uh, and then they're run through this series of benchmarks. Um, uh, Rust, uh, running on WebAssembly, actually did better than all of the leading JavaScript frameworks. Uh, it's, it, this is, you know, again, due to the fact that Rust is able to compile to very, very runtime efficient code. Um, running on WebAssembly, it was able to do a really good job. Interestingly, it still was not doing as well as Elm, uh, which was tied for first place. All three of, of the things that got a um, you know, score of 99 on the Lighthouse performance, um, Elm was one of them, uh, you know, even though Elm was compiling to JavaScript. And again, this speaks to Elm's focus. Elm is able to, because it's a programming language designed to be used for browser-based UIs, it's able to do a really good job like excelling in that domain. Um, another of Elm's goals is not just to have really good runtime performance, but another thing that's very important for browser-based apps is compiled asset size. In other words, how long people take to download and, and execute your application, especially on mobile devices. Um, so this is the same application, but now looking at the compiled bundle size of this application. Um, so here we can see uh, Vue, React, and Angular, a little bit more of a split there. So Vue is at like 70 kilobytes for this application, React is at 97, Angular is at 141. So Angular is about double the size of the, the Vue application for this app. Um, and the Elm one uh, is actually about half the size of the Vue one. So even though they're sort of <laughs> similar on the chart, uh, there's a really substantial gap in terms of compiled asset size here. Um, Rust, which is not at all optimized for compiled bundle size, although it runs quite fast at runtime, uh, the compiled WebAssembly for all this stuff is absolutely enormous. I mean, Angular is 140 kilobytes. The Rust one is close to 300 kilobytes, almost double the size of, of Angular. Um, so we can see that, uh, again, Elm is, is, in this case, it's not the absolute top of the heap. Uh, Svelte is the number one, uh, like, smallest bundle size, which one would expect because the entire point of Svelte, it, its sort of goal is to make the smallest possible bundles. Um, but Elm is, is doing very, very well compared to these other uh, more, more popular frameworks, which uh, it also runs faster than. Um, so the last thing that, that Elm and Rust uh, have in, in common here is they both have intentionally helpful compilers. And, and the, sort of the, the experience with interacting with their compilers is a big part of what is involved in using them as languages. Um, just an example of one of Elm's error messages. Uh, so this user record does not have a phone number field. So you can imagine if I was writing user.phone number, but I misspelled it, um, I would get this error message. And I would say, this is usually a typo. Here are the user fields that are most similar. It lists the different fields that were on that record, one of which is phone number. And it even goes as far as to suggest, hey, so maybe phone number should be phone number. So I picked this example kind of at random, but I think this is a really good example of what it's like to see, get an error message from Elm's compiler in general. Like whatever went wrong, the compiler generally tends to give you about as much help as it possibly can, um, including suggestions about what, what might be a potential fix. Um, among people I know who have used Elm, like seriously, like built an actual application with it, I don't know a single person who does not think that Elm has the most helpful, the best compiler error messages of any programming language in the world. Um, it's just considered the gold standard. And uh, this is a, really one of the most delightful parts about using the language and, and sort of speaks to that, like Elm successfully achieving its goal of aspiring to be a, a delightful programming language. Um, that's not to say that, that Rust is bad. Um, Rust does a, quite a good job at this too. Um, I would say not as good as Elm, but uh, it, it does have uh, relatively helpful error messages compared to a lot of other languages that I've used. So this is an example of one of those borrow checker uh, errors. Um, cannot borrow foo.bar as mutable more than once. 
Um, and you can see uh, it's got similar kind of like underlining of like which parts of the text uh, went wrong. You can see the line numbers in the margin. Um, and it's got a, a good bit of context on what's going on here. It doesn't quite have as much detail as, as the Elm uh, message does or, or any hints. Uh, but you can add a dash dash explain flag and, and sort of copy paste in the error number that you got from the, the compiler to get a little bit more detail. So it's not really inline, it's not as contextual as the Elm error, but you can still get um, more detail if you want it. This does uh, unfortunately highlight one of the downsides of Rust, which is uh, you do have this entire extra category of errors that come from the borrow checker. And borrow checker errors are sort of notorious for being something that especially beginners to Rust spend a lot of time dealing with and being frustrated by. The phrase uh, fighting the borrow checker is something that is a pretty normal thing for people to express when they're first learning Rust. And I can say I've been doing Rust for a couple of years now. Um, it's something that I've gotten much, much better at, but I still spend more time dealing with borrow checker errors than with pretty much every other type of error that I get at compile time put together. Um, so it's definitely one of the downsides that comes with the many upsides that we've, we've come with, uh, talked about over the course of discussing these two languages. And worth noting that I still very much like Rust as a language and I'm happy to use it. Um, but uh, this is sort of like one of the areas where I think uh, Elm, it really, really shines. And Rust does a good job, but but uh, not quite as good a job. Um, putting these two together, though, I mean, one of the things that, that people commonly say when using either of these languages is, if it compiles, it usually works. Um, that's been very true for me in, in uh, my experience with Elm. Less true with Rust, but still often, uh, often true. Um, this is especially true with refactors. Uh, if, if I refactor my Elm code, really no matter how big of a change I'm making, if it compiles again when it's done, I expect it to work. Uh, less true with Rust, but still quite often true. And uh, this is one of the things that I think the next generation of programming languages are, are going to become sort of like table stakes for. Um, it's really hard to go back after you've had this experience. Um, if you want to learn more about either language, uh, here are some relevant links. Um, so rustlang.org or elmlang.org are their homepages. Uh, they both have um, free books that you can use to, to learn the language from scratch. Uh, Rust has doc.rustlang.org slash book. Elm has guide.elmlang.org. And they both have um, forums where you can jump on, ask beginner questions. So that's users.rustlang.org or discourse.elmlang.org. Thanks very much.